Hello and behind me is Concorde, one of the most interesting and iconic aircraft ever made. In this video I'm going to take you on a detailed tour of it. First we're going to walk around the outside and I'm going to point out what makes it unique and interesting and then we're going to go up inside and have a look. So let's get into it. To appreciate a lot of this aircraft you have to understand the wing which is clearly very different to other normal airliners. It is an Ogival Delta wing with the Delta bit being essentially a large triangle and the Ogival part being because it doesn't have a straight leading edge but a rather smooth OG curve. And apologies to the engineering students out there if I've mispronounced those words and feel free to comment below. At supersonic speeds, a short wingspan is preferred as it generates less drag but still adequate lift. But at low speed, such a design wouldn't generate enough lift. Therefore, it requires a huge amount of power to take off and a dangerously high takeoff and landing speed. So this is where the Ogival Delta shape comes into play as it's relatively narrow, but it's able to generate strong vortices on the upper surfaces at a high angle of attack. This reduces the pressure above the wing, thus creating lift. These vortices increased in strength the longer the wing is, hence why it continues back as far along the fuselage as possible. But as we walk down to the ground level, and yes we will go inside later, this shape was the best compromise to avoid too much drag at high speed, but enough lift at low speed. An alternative would have been the variable sweeper wing like this F-14 Tomcat, which is the best of both worlds, but too complex and heavy for an aircraft this size. Still, its low speed performance wasn't great, and it requires a high angle of attack, which means that it had to be angled back with the nose right up in the air to generate those vortices. This then created a few significant problems which explains the shape of the rest of the aircraft. Now during takeoff to generate the lift, the nose would be raised right up in the sky and in doing so the tail would then droop down like a seesaw. To avoid it hitting the ground, the whole plane itself had to be raised, hence why it has a very long landing gear. Now here we are at the nose wheel. The whole undercarriage had to be unusually strong because of the added stress of high takeoff and landing speeds, again because of the limited lift from the wings, so everything just had to be faster to compensate. The nose wheels were inflated to around 190 psi in comparison to your car which is around 30 to 35. Brakes were also needed to be strong, again due to the high speeds and Concorde was the first airliner to use carbon based brakes which not only handled the temperatures better than steel, but were around 500 kilograms lighter. After a typical landing into Heathrow, the brakes were usually around 300 to 500 degrees Celsius. Another issue was the nose, which was streamlined to minimize drag at supersonic cruise, and there was also a visor that would cover the windscreen to also make it a little bit more slippery. But, with such a high angle of attack used for takeoff and landing, the nose would be aimed up so high that it would completely obscure the flight deck's view forward. Therefore, it was designed to bend down by 5 degrees on takeoff and 12.5 degrees for landing. Due to the high speeds, aerodynamic heating became a major complication. They used an aluminium alloy called Hydrinium RR58, and the highest temperature it could tolerate was 127 degrees which limited the top speed to Mach 2.02. When the fuselage was heating up, it would expand by as much as 300 millimeters or up to 12 inches. To cool both the cabin and the hydraulics, they pumped the fuel around as a heat sink similar to the SR-71. So the fuel was used like radiator liquid to absorb the heat and then take it to the engines where it became a lot hotter. There were also restrictions on the outside paint as white was better at reflecting heat. The white paint reduces skin temperature by 6 to 11 degrees Celsius. In fact, in 1996, Air France briefly painted one of theirs in a blue livery due to a promotional deal with Pepsi. Because of the extra heat, they were advised to remain at Mach 2 for no more than 20 minutes at a time. Now let's have a look at the engines and the variable air intake. The air intake design was incredibly complex with front and rear ramps, a dumper door, an auxiliary inlet and a ramp bleed that went straight to the exhaust nozzle. These were all used automatically to maintain the best air intake depending For on the example, aircraft speed. When in supersonic cruise, the air would need to slow down to subsonic speed so that the jet engine could use it efficiently. Air travelling at above Mark III could be used in a ramjet design similar to the SR-71 but the Concorde had a different design. 
and it wasn't going up to Mach 3. And in the case of an engine failure at supersonic speed, the drag would be huge and could even cause a catastrophic failure of the airframe. So to avoid this, the front ramps would close immediately forcing air down below the engine and actually create some lift. Excess air that did enter would then leave via the auxiliary spill door rather than being forced into the inoperable engine. Now Concord was powered by four Rolls-Royce Olympus 593s, which were an upgraded version of the engine in the subsonic Avro Vulcan bomber. Interestingly, they're the older turbojet design, with the reason being that the newer turbo fans were too large and would generate excessive drag. The problem is that turbojets were louder, but when the engine decisions were made, silencing technology was planned but didn't actually end up eventuating, resulting in a lot of noise complaints both from the jet engines and the sonic booms. At the rear, you have these variable exhaust nozzles and inside were the after-burning facilities. Now the reheating, which is what the British call afterburners, is where fuel is dumped into the exhaust and the resulting explosion causes more thrust, but obviously at the cost of higher fuel consumption. This stuff here is simply the air conditioning and power unit for the display. Concorde only used the afterburner during takeoff and when passing through the upper transonic region to supersonic cruise. The engines were really inefficient at low speed, in fact during the taxiing to the runway they could burn 2 tonnes of A1 fuel, which was just under 2% of the total fuel load. But while they were thirsty, they were very powerful. In fact, even at idle, the brakes had to be continuously applied to prevent the aircraft from rolling. So after landing, they would actually turn off both the outer engines to avoid causing too much brake wear. Now you'll notice the downward camber on the wings, and this was found to create more stability during cross-wind landings. Now we'll take a step back and take in the incredible shape of the Concorde. Not only is it functional, but it is beautiful at the same time. And as you can see, the British Airways livery proudly on display. Unfortunately, Concorde had financial problems from the start, and while many airlines, including Qantas, ordered them, only BA and Air France actually took delivery, as they were strongly encouraged by their respective governments. The reality was that those two governments had invested so much that they would have gone into strife for spending so much taxpayer money if no airlines actually bought the aircraft. You'll notice that the tail tapers upwards, and this is to reduce the risk of a tail strike during takeoff. Remember that the wings require the nose to be raised high in the air to generate any lift at low speed, therefore the tail will drop down and that's why uh, there is this tail strike wheel that folds up with the main landing gear. You'll notice that there are no horizontal stabilizers and instead the wings trailing edge, which is the back of it, has what is called elevons which function both as elevators which controls the pitch up and down and would normally be the horizontal stabilizers jobs and the ailerons which control the roll and hence the turning. You'll also notice that there is no APU exhaust at the tail and that's because there isn't one. It would have been extra weight and there was already minimal room inside. Because Concorde really stuck to the major airports there would always be a ground power unit which it could immediately attach to to maintain all of its systems once the engines are turned off. Now when we look at it from directly behind, you can see how narrow the fuselage actually is. Obviously it creates less drag, but it explains why the interior was so cramped as I'll show you shortly. As we walk forward and head inside, it's interesting that radiation actually became a problem in Concorde because of the higher cruising altitude at around 60,000 feet. It had around double the flux of extraterrestrial ionizing radiation than a Boeing 747 at 40,000 feet for comparison's sake. But because the flights were shorter due to the much higher speeds, uh, with a cruise of around 2,100 kilometers an hour, the exposure would be shorter. But it was measured in flight anyway, and if the levels were going too high due to some unusual solar activity, they would descend to 47,000 feet. As we continue to walk forward, I'll mention that there was a Concorde B model under design, and this had a number of upgrades. These included larger wings with leading edge slats which would increase lift at lower speeds. It also had larger fuel tanks and an upgraded engine that would have no longer needed the afterburner, therefore reducing the noise problem and improved fuel economy. But this was cancelled in the 1970s due to poor sales and the increasing fuel costs. Now just quickly, these bits and bobs under here. The four darker circles are the radio altimeters which, as they sound, detect the altitude by sending radio waves down and calculating how long they take to bounce back. 
This here is the heated drain mast. Remember that it's colder than minus 40 degrees up there, so any liquid would immediately freeze before it's expelled, so it had to be heated up. And next to it is the VHF radio antenna. Moving a little further forward is the marker. And then there's the ventral luggage hatch, and then a DME, which stands for Distance Measurement Equipment, and used to work out the aircraft's location, as was with the marker. Now let's head upstairs, and as we pan over to the right, you can see how sharp the angle is at the forward part of the wing. And also how small the windows are, but it's otherwise a very cool view for any aviation geek. As you enter, you have to duck your head, and I'm only 180 centimeters tall. Now everything is protected by glass, and while it's good that things are being well maintained, it did make filming difficult. On the left is the flight deck, where you have the captain on the left, first officer on the right, and behind them, and also on the right side, was the flight engineer. Now just near the camera are circuit breakers on both sides. Spinning around clockwise, you've got the emergency exit, and then the galley. Now Concord was known for its first class dining with lobster and champagne, although the galley was certainly pretty small so the flight attendants did very well. And here we are moving into the forward of two cabins, and again there's really not a lot of space. Now there was a single class on board Concord and it was first class. The seats were all in a 2-2 layout, and considering these tickets cost well, more than first class on other aircraft, there really wasn't much room. And the fact that both first and business class seats in a BA777 or 747 went completely flat, you can understand why some would have preferred to have paid less for a better seat but on a slower plane. Considering the incredible view that you would get on board Concorde, unfortunately the windows were very small. Because it cruised at such a high altitude, if there was a sudden cabin decompression, then passengers and crew would lose consciousness very quickly. To help reduce the speed in which the cabin pressure would be lost, smaller windows and therefore holes in the fuselage were used. There was also a reserve air supply system to augment cabin pressure while the aircraft took a quick dive down to a lower altitude. Now the pilots would be okay because, as with all airliners, their emergency oxygen is delivered with positive pressure rather than simply being an oxygen cupped to your face. Now positive pressure was like when you were a kid and you stuck your head out of the car window facing forwards and you got that air blown into your face and into your mouth. Depending on the specific arrangements, there were around 40 seats in the forward cabin and 60 in the rear. There's two toilets on both sides of the aisle, and a quick look into the aft passenger cabin, and then we're walking outside to be greeted again by an amazing view, and we're back to where we started. If you like these types of videos, please check out my channel for many more similar tours, um, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.